Okay, greetings everybody. Nice to see you all. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to today's screening of Fauci, which probably you've heard about. It's, it's a phenomenal film from what I hear and I'm about to see it for the first time. Of course, it's a documentary directed by Emmy winners John Hoffman and Janet Tobias. The film was executive produced by Academy Award winner Dan Kogan and two-time Academy Award nominee and Brown grad, who you'll meet later, Liz Garbus, um, who will serve on the panel in, uh, after the screening. So um, as I mentioned, after the screening, we're going to have a panel discussion that's going to be led by Professor Adam Levine, who's the director of the Watson Institute's Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies. Adam, as some of you know, is also an ER doc. He's a faculty member at the Alfred School of Medicine. He's an ER doc, and he's also a public health expert. Adam is going to introduce the panelists later on, uh, but let me just say that the, the panel today will include, as I mentioned, Liz Garbus, the executive producer of the film, Janet Tobias, uh, one of the co-directors, Peter Staley, who many of you probably know. He's a public health advocate and activist who really became very famous at um, the time of AIDS, and, and uh, you'll see the connection to the film. And also Stephanie Friedhoff, who's a professor at the Brown School of Public Health, and she's really quite central to the communications effort at SPH, which again relates to the theme of the film. Uh, I really also want to mention that today's event is, of course, part of the Watson Institute's John F. Kennedy Jr. Film Initiative, a documentary film, uh, initiative for documentary film and social uh, progress. Um, this event today is co-sponsored along with the Brown School of Public Health. Uh, I don't want to do a long introduction, but let me just say a few things. This is the first in-person event that we've had for the initiative since just before COVID began. The, the first uh, event of our new initiative was for the film, yeah, exactly, for the, for the film Coup 53. It was a, just a fantastic screening, much like this one, with a fantastic uh, panel discussion afterward. And we had hopes for just a whole string of in-person events that were planned. And of course, it was extremely disappointing that those in-person events didn't happen. But instead of those in-person events, we just had a series of virtual events running all throughout that spring and through the summer and through all of last year, which in their own way were really phenomenal and addressing contemporary issues and with top documentaries and filmmakers. It's been an incredible ride. And the fact that we're together again today just makes me extremely optimistic about the future and where things will will go. You know, the, the film that we're screening today is, I think, it's important for a lot of reasons, but it's important for two, at least with respect to the, the themes and the values that have motivated the John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, film initiative. So first, obviously, this is a film about a person, actually more than a per several people, who've dedicated their lives to public service and dedicated their lives not in ways that benefit them, not in ways that make them money and all these kinds of things, but instead actually in ways that cost them a lot, as you'll see in this film, cost them in terms of the conflict that they end up engaging in, the pushback they get, the tensions, the threats, but engaged in public service in ways that help individuals and entire communities in really improving the way they live their lives and sustaining their lives, including in times of real crisis. And for sure, I think those are values that John F. Kennedy Jr. stood for. There's a, a second feature of this film that I think is really important, and that's that it's being done through film. That, look, we at the Watson Institute are anchored in the social sciences, yes, and we have our social scientific methods, but we also know and, and believe strongly in the idea that there are other paths to truth. And one of the most important paths through, to truth comes through the arts, of which film is a part. And the idea that we are discussing today, and we will on this panel, be discussing public service and public action, but also looking at it through the lens, not just of the sciences and the social sciences, but looking at, <coughs> pardon me, looking at through the lens of art feels to me, again, very important as foundational values for what this initiative is all about. And though, as I mentioned, really, at the first event we had at, at Coup 53, I didn't have the fortune, the good fortune, of knowing John F. Kennedy Jr. personally or, or, or meeting him. 
but from those I know who know him, um, I think it's accurate to say and fair to say that this idea of connecting the arts with public service and public events and current pressing issues, that that connection was part of his life and part of his ambition, ranging from his activity here at Brown when he was a student in the theater, all the way to his founding of, of the publication George. This connection between the arts and public service and current events, all as part of an effort to convey truth and to get people to talk about what truth really means. To me, that's the legacy that John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, leaves with us and that we're carrying forward with our students and with all of you in a, in a very positive manner. Um, I feel honored to be part of it, frankly. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank another Brown alum who's just been really a driving force in this initiative, um, and that's Randall Poster, who's here today. And so with that, although I said I wouldn't do a long introduction, you've been very patient, I went on too long. But again, welcome, and let's watch Fauci. And please stay for the panel discussion after. And now we're gonna turn it over to the panel discussion. Again, the panel will be moderated by Adam Levine, who's the director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at Watson. And as I mentioned, Adam is also a faculty member at the Albert Medical School. He's a practicing emergency medicine doctor, as well as a public health specialist in his own right. But Adam, let me turn it over to you to introduce everybody and continue the conversation. Uh, thank you so much. And it's really wonderful to be here with all of you today, and I'm so thrilled to be able to moderate this incredible panel that we have with us today to discuss, uh, to discuss this incredible film that you all just saw. So I will just start by introducing all of our panelists here today with us, and then I'll start with a few questions for them, and we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So please do start thinking about the questions you want to ask, and when it does come time, we'll ask you to stand up to one of the mics on either side to ask your questions. So first, we're very thrilled to have with us uh, Liz Garbus, the executive producer of this film, two-time Academy Award nominee, two-time Emmy winner, Peabody winner, Grammy nominee, BJA nominee, BAFTA-nominated director, and most importantly, uh, a Brown alumni. <laughs> <laughs> Her work has been featured in film festivals from Sundance to Telluride to Toronto to the New York Film Festival and has appeared in theaters across streaming platforms as well as premium cable television. She is known for her propulsive, socially incisive storytelling across genres, from the Oscar-nominated The Farm and Goalie USA to the Oscar-nominated and an Emmy Award-winning What Happened, Miss Simone, to I'll Be Gone in the Dark. Garbus has created some of the most important documentaries of our time. We're really thrilled to have her with us here. I think I wrote that bio, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, she's joined uh, by Janet Tobias, the director and producer of the film as well. Uh, Janet is an Emmy and Peabody uh, Award winner and a two-time Writers Guild of America nominee. She made her feature documentary debut in Toronto in 2012 with No Place on Earth, which Variety called a substantial contribution to Holocaust cinema. In 2017, Unseen Enemy was a prescient look at the 21st century threat of epidemics. And her most recent feature, Memory Games, uh, debuted at Doc NYC in 2018. She's a longtime journalist, and her, her career has included stints at NBC, ABC, and PBS, covering a range of domestic and international stories. Since 2001, her company, Sierra Tango Productions, uh, has produced documentaries on a range of pressing social issues. And in 2019, she co-founded the nonprofit Global Health Reporting Center, which is dedicated to covering key health issues of our time. She's produced 11 pieces for PBS NewsHour and a feature documentary, Race for the Vaccine, for BBC CNN, uh, that reviewers called gripping and inspiring. So we're really excited to have her with us here. And I today. paid him too. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun to just be able to talk about <laughs> such wonderful people. Um, Peter Staley, who you all saw featured in the film, has been a long-term AIDS and gay rights activist, first as a member of ACT UP New York, then as founding director of TAG, the Treatment Action Group. He was a 2016 fellow at Harvard's Institute of Politics and is a leading subject in the Oscar-nominated documentary, How to Survive a Plague. More recently, Staley co-founded the Prep for All collaboration and the COVID-19 Working Group New York. 
and is the lead named plaintiff in Staley versus Gilead, a major federal antitrust lawsuit um, uh, against Big Pharma set for trial next year. He recently published his memoirs titled Never Silent, Act Up, and My Life in Activism. And then finally, we are joined by our own uh, Stephanie Friedhoff from the Brown School of Public Health. She's an associate professor of practice in health services policy and practice and strategy director of the Brown University School of Public Health. Her work investigates intersecting issues of health equity, science, technology, media, culture, and trauma. At the School of Public Health, she leads the Dean's crisis communication and pandemic policy response team, including research collaborations, rapid response, and data projects and serves as a strategic advisor to the Dean. Uh, she's also a veteran journalist and has previously worked as an editor, foreign correspondent, and feature writer on three continents. Her work has appeared in Time Magazine, the Boston Globe, Stat News, Geo, and many other uh, publications. I'm very pleased and let's thank all of our panelists here for joining us today. Um, so I'll start off maybe with a question for you, Liv. Uh, tell me what brought this project together, and was it difficult to get uh, Tony Fauci to participate? <laughs> well, that's really a question for Janet. Okay. Uh, the project started with Janet, so I'll jump in and Absolutely. get a chance at that too. Um, so I, I had this sort of great good fortune to, um, after a film we did called Unseen Enemy about um, pandemics, to be on a panel um, with Tony Fauci, and he liked the film, and so he said, um, I'd like to do something with you, and I thought, great, my father, who was a scientist, I finally lived up to his expectations. <laughs> um, and so um, we started a project actually about AIDS, the AIDS vaccine research in South Africa, and um, worked on that, and in that process, it became really clear that Tony Fauci um, was an incredible story in himself. So in December of 2018, I asked him if he would let us do a film about him. And then in the way that docs work, we sort of um, sat around working on other things and started shooting a tiny bit in the fall of 2019. And then of course the pandemic happened. And with that, I was smart enough to team up with Story Syndicate um, because I knew that we needed the best people and the resources. And so John Hoffman, my co-director who had a, has a long, incredible career working at NIH, um, and I just um, teamed up, and Liz and her husband and partner, Dan Kogan, um, were our uh, guiding executive producers. So that's basically how we started. And it wasn't hard before the pandemic, he thought about it, but I, I don't think we would have, we wouldn't have gotten to start filming in March without having had a prior relationship, because he was, sleeping three and four hours a night. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and maybe this is a question for both of you. I'm, I'm really curious, was the Fauci you expected to find when you started <laughs> filming this documentary the same as the person you came to know by the end of it? Do you, do you like from watching, yeah. Um, well, I mean, one of the things that I think is so, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the film, of course, is about Fauci and it's about this pandemic <laughs> and his career, but it's also just about what it means to live a life of, of public service, I think. And I think um, his career resonates so deeply in that, you know, that extraordinary commitment. Um, and, you know, I don't know him personally, so it's really for Janet to answer, but I mean, what I, what I, what was so remarkable as the film was coming together was during the AIDS crisis, you know, he was, of course, villainized and, um, you know, was this divisive figure, but he was able in some ways at some times, you know, and, and you all heard Peter's stories to bring people together mm -hmm. on different sides of this debate. And what was, in, it just, it never happened really with, with COVID, right? And it was just such an interesting expression of our, looking at his career as an expression of the, of the, um, partisan politics of this moment and how detrimental they can be to public health and messaging and just looking at the AIDS crisis versus this, pande this pandemic um, and where we've come as a country. It just that, that to me is such an interesting way of looking at, at Tony, which Janet did with you know, Peter's support. And, and, with the, and with John, right? And with John, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I was interested before the pandemic in why someone already in a sort of divisive society where 
you're valued if you work in the movies, you're valued if you're a sports star. People don't really value people anymore who spend decades in public service. And so I was really interested in why someone would spend you know, four decades um, in public service and how that had evolved from Reagan through essentially now seven presidents. Um, and, um, and I think at the core, Tony has remained the same person that I met. Um, uh, but getting to know him um, better, um, you see a person who is incredibly grounded. I have rarely seen in decades of filmmaking someone who has the ability to reach across in an ordinary way. Oftentimes there are stars and they have light around them and they actually suck up the air in the room. And Tony has this great ability to be likable, on focus, always grounded, um, and to absorb what's going on in a, in a room and move out from that, whether it is with an activist or a president or a member of his staff. And um, it, is, it is sort of a likable charisma on a grounded level that I've almost never quite seen. Um, and that's allowed him to navigate for four decades through all those presidents, all those different administrations. And I will say in the summer of 2020, it was sometimes slightly heartbreaking to watch someone who's always been successful keep trying and trying and come up against walls, right? Um, but Peter has known him as a friend through all that. He you know, stood out where people next to him were burning him in effigy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, I, I've known him for a long time and uh, uh, come to know, know him a lot more since COVID. Um, we had, you know, prior to COVID, it was, uh, we'd touch, touch base maybe just a few times a year and um, over when we would have a, a new HIV project that we would want to bounce off in, or there would be something on a personal level, like uh, bringing in Tony to help with Larry Kramer's care when he was in the hospital and uh, about a decade ago. Um, but uh, it had it had never gelled into something that was uh, what I would call a close friendship in, until COVID hit, and a bunch of us, a, a few of us, pinged him when COVID hit, uh, just to, you know, not wanting to tie him up with policy stuff, but to just say, are you doing okay? <laughs> you know, we see you at the, in the fire here at, at, at Trump's White House. It's like, are you okay? Um, and uh, he, would, he would text back, uh, I'll, I'll call you. And I would do this right after I'd see him on TV. And so he'd call me from the car, car on the way home and he would want to vent and um, and our relationship from the AIDS years had always been one uh, where that was you know filled with respect uh, I just knew the guy was brilliant and admired his political skills and knew he cared deeply about AIDS but also one where I was constantly saying you're not doing good enough you're not, you know, you're you're doing this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. So I said to him, I said, do you want me? Do you want to hear what I, you know, what I thought of what you said at the mic? <laughs> and he would say, sure. And it, and sometimes my reviews were very mixed. And and to his credit, I mean, he doesn't push that away. He he, the relationship got so much more close last year or 2020. Uh, during all this. And I spent half the year loving the guy and the other half just furious with him. Because uh, we started, all the AIDS activists leaked into COVID activism. So not only was he, you know, under fire from the far right and in the national limelight, and I was giving him personal advice on how to handle all that stuff, uh, but I was also pushing him because we had activist stuff to bring to him on COVID, and we didn't think he was doing enough in certain areas. Um, 
So it got really intense and has remained so ever since, but it's just deepened and deepened into a, something that I cherish and I think we both cherish. So. Yeah. Can I just say that if people are interested in the way in which activism can change the future for epidemics and pandemics, watch Peter and How to Survive a Plague, which is an extraordinary film of how about how regular citizens became the cutting edge of science to you know, make AIDS not be a, a death sentence. It's extraordinary. So. Yeah. Well, actually, I was going to follow up along that strain with you, Peter. So actually, by coincidence, last week, um, I led a panel at this global forum on humanitarian health research that's sponsored by the NIH. And the panel that I happened to be leading was on inclusive and participatory humanitarian research, which is a buzzword today that has basically become the standard of practice for any global health research, which simply means that before you start a research study, you are involving the local community and now mm -hmm. really even thinking beyond just community involvement, but the diversity of those communities and how we ensure that those voices are involved in the project from start to finish in the design, in carrying it out, and in disseminating it. And when I watched the film, it occurred to me that, you know, wow, this was a radical idea <laughs> in the 1980s. And probably a lot of this sort of given that we have today around inclusive and participatory research came from the work of ACT UP. And mm -hmm. did you guys think about that as you were sort of pushing this at the beginning, that this shouldn't be a radical thing, that it should just be part of how science works? Uh, yeah, I mean, we were insisting on it. Uh, we started doing our homework and uh, uh, we, you know, at, at first our demands were pretty naive, but within about a year and a half they had matured into something that was very useful and we were pretty convinced that it was going to be very useful to the research establishment. Um, we had certainly put AIDS on the agenda nationally as a news story um, and, and the federal dollars were, were beginning to soar in Tony's budget and, and throughout the NIH. And we wanted uh, to have a say in how those dollars were spent and, and how the research was being done. And uh, the research establishment was scared to death of us. I mean, you know, prior to ACT UP, the attitude among the white coats was uh, patients, you know, you just tell them what's going on. They don't, <laughs> they don't tell you what to do. And uh, uh, we had a different game plan. We were like, no, we're going to have a, you're going to listen to us as well. So, uh, and the amazing thing was one of the few scientists in the government that was willing to talk to us from day one was Tony Fauci. Uh, most of them were quite scared of us. Um, but he noticed that we had been doing our homework and that there was a give and take that started. Uh, and he was politically aware enough to know that when we were screaming at him from the outside in the huge demonstrations uh, and putting his, you know, head on a spike. <laughs> it wasn't personal. And a coffin that said, <laughs> fuck Fauci and things like that. It, he knew not to take it too personally. And that, you know, a lot of our targets could not do that. They mm -hmm. just, they took it so personally, uh, which is a natural human reaction. But. Um, Tony Fauci is not partisan, but he is very political. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, so he knew, he knew the game we were playing. And I, I would just jump in and say you could see all of Peter and their work play out in COVID, because I was able to sit in on a lot of the science meetings, and you would watch the discussion of Moderna is not enrolling enough African-American people. We must get them to do it. And week after week, there would be discussions of more diversity in the trials. And they actually forced Moderna to slow down their trials behind Pfizer, because they were originally ahead, to enroll more African-Americans. So, and, and that they, is all because and they did of it. Peter and the ACT UP work. They did it with this. the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, which we had forced in the 90s because uh, the, the original AIDS trials were all in white gay men. And we forced Fauci and NIAID to slowly improve that to where they got it really good at enrolling women and people of color in AIDS trials mm -hmm. by 1995. And the AIDS clinical trials group is still around. So when Moderna had this problem of enrollment, they, they uh, put some of, they used the AIDS clinical trials group for enrollment purposes. 
Um, it, so it, AIDS, all the stuff we built during AIDS was used during COVID, and it was very gratifying to see. Well, as a follow-up to that, what advice would you have for researchers here at Brown, students who will one day be researchers uh, around involving communities in their work? Yeah, no, I mean, you're gonna, you know, uh, uh, let them in. <laughs> don't, uh, don't dismiss them and uh, uh, bring them along. They, you know, they, they will give you a very interesting perspectives on how to enroll better enroll clinical trials, for instance. It's a very obvious. Um, you know, when, when they talk to each other about the kind of trials that they find it attractive to enroll in, you might the researcher might learn something from hearing those comments. So, um, uh, But definitely, uh, uh, it's a two-way street, and uh, there's no, no looking back on that now. So don't <laughs> resist. <laughs> um. I have a question for Stephanie. Uh, so I was fascinated, you know, both about your public health and also your journalism background. And, you know, I've worked in a lot of epidemics around the world in cholera and Ebola and now COVID-19. And one thing that always strikes me about epidemics is it seems that humans only have two different modes, complete apathy or utter panic. <laughs> and yet what we really need uh, in the time of a pandemic or an epidemic is, you know, very clear communication and very clear uh, messaging uh, that people can take to heart. And did you find, uh, what are your thoughts on how messaging was done during this COVID pandemic and how could it have been improved from your perspective as a journalist? <laughs> I'm going to take up one minute. Excellent question. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for the film. Thank you for all the work that you're doing, each and every one of you. It's fantastic. Um, again, and just bringing this to Brown and, and for all of us to think with you and to learn from you. I'm really very thrilled to be here. Um, that's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we heard from Tom Frieden in the film, right? Communication is at the core. Communication has been at the tail end of this pandemic. Um, we live in a very different communications environment from even Ebola, but definitely the HIV AIDS and definitely even also the previous SARS um, outbreaks that we've had, both in terms of the, um, the information ecosystem, right? Everybody, you know, more people get their news from social media now than from any, any other source. Um, that, that's like a whole other thing to talk about. What's interesting the way you drew it out in the film is with then the so that's the the media ecosystem part then you have a part about politicization and the divisiveness that, that we talked about a little bit right there's like overlaying factors right now that make this a unique and complicated environment in which to communicate um and and tony of course always has the role of the like tell it as it is type person um in in an era where there's less and less place for that so we we talk a lot and and I, I i already took so many notes right part of the work that we're doing right now is in communities of color around vaccine hesitancy um there's a a, a lot of components around uh, how do we tell these stories of, of communities and especially of, of uh, black community members who um for historic for reasons of historic mistrust right are more hesitant to currently get vaccinated for example um the vaccine wasn't tested in people like me is one of the key reasons in those communities to feel at least cautious about the vaccine. Those are not anti-vaxxers, those are not like the unvaccinated, right? These are all the terms that we can up, come up with in this communications environment um, for all the wrong reasons, right? Um, but, but what we're learning from these communities of color right now is that they don't feel comfortable speaking up. Right? We're the activists right now that are speaking up for people of color who say, well, I have concerns. You know, there's a the few of them, but, but way not enough. And it's really hard. And we had a specific case where um, community leaders feel really strongly um, that the, the mandates, the vaccine mandates, for example, are not helpful. But at the same time, they don't feel confident in speaking about that. And I was thinking about that watching Tony, and I've known Tony for over a decade as a, sorry, just as a reporter, covered him a few times. Um, and um, thinking about that he 
tells it as it is, but there's all the surrounding factors. And we saw the, you know, of course, this, the, the scene was lovely cut together with, you know, when, when he spoke before and, and uh, the, the president spoke after him. Um, Tony has an authenticity that is a currency in every communications environment. And that is what is so striking about him and why it has still worked. Like we, we, we say a lot that in a social media world, you have to be authentic in your communication. And Tony has never lost it. And that was another, I think it was President Bush, right, who said, um, he, you know, you don't want him for the politics. Right? <laughs> He's just going to tell it as. It. And that, I think, is, is why he has continued to be successful amidst all these changes because he's got that authenticity. You always know what you get from Tony, and you may like it or you may not, right? But that's... Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, you know, it reminds me a lot. During the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, when I was in Liberia there, there was a real concerted effort to reach out to each individual community, to each individual tribe, to each individual uh, corner of the country with messaging that was targeted towards their needs and their interests. And there was a whole anthropologic anthropology platform of anthropologists who'd set up you know, a platform to rapidly do anthropological research to figure out what communities' concerns were around uh, you know, Ebola messaging, around the idea that Ebola was real, and around you know, various treatment and um, public health messaging to reduce transmission. Um, and yet, and you know, when I was there, there was a rap song about Ebola, about Ebola, there was a children's song about Ebola, there was a pop song about Ebola that was top of the charts in Monrovia, and yet it seems like we forgot all of that or didn't do any of that in the United States. We had sort of one set of messaging or maybe two sets of messaging, depending on whether you're watching Fox News or MSNBC, but we didn't seem to have this idea of targeted messaging to individual communities and realizing that there wasn't going to be one message that worked for all. And you know, I wonder if, um, you know, if that is an area that we could have improved upon during the last year and a half. I mean, I mean, <laughs> definitely we should have. I definitely yeah. have opinions on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, um, yes, we we invested targeted, forty billion in distribution and maybe three in yeah. communication. Yeah. I'm tr desperately trying to get to the actual numbers right now, which is hard. Yeah. Again, communication is an afterthought. We think about supply. We don't think about demand. Uh, we have this in testing, we have this in, in vaccine uptake, of course. Um, it is easy to focus on the technical, and it's much harder to focus on these like soft, squishy, right? Why do people do anything type of topics? We also have a belief that communication can fix everything. The pandemic has brought, as we all know, to the surface, the deep disparities in the American society and, you know, I'm a German American, so mm -hmm. lived in a number of different societies and seen different systems. And again, it's so interesting to, to see the comparisons to the HIV AIDS moment, right? Which which was for partic was for a particular part of the population that was affected, um, had the level of education to be outspoken, right? And um, and and made a tremendous difference, and. Um, when when we th sort of the 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 what comes but like so what the communication can fix right now we need the targeted communication there are uh, community organizations across the country that are working on that of course um, but what we cannot fix is like what do we hear from them in our research it is um, sure Tony, Tony came to the barber shop um, the guy who owns the barber shop in Chicago still isn't vaccinated you know. His friend got killed the other day. COVID is one of many threads. Mm -hmm. It is by far not the 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 one that is you know that has the, brings the highest risk. Um, so these are the types of underlying issues that the COVID pandemic has has brought to the surface. Um, so while I think yes, targeted communication is really essential and important, and it can move a lot of people towards getting vaccinated. In this case, mm -hmm. it's not going to fix you know, the underlying problems and, and sort of, um, you can't, like, that's, that, that's not about changing minds, right? Mm, right. Mm. So one last question for the filmmakers and then open it up to the audience. So please uh, feel free to start 
coming up to the mics now uh, to ask your questions. Um, so um, I had the opportunity actually um, to work with Cliff Lane, who was uh, featured in the documentary at the beginning. In fact, I was on a conference call with him every Monday and Wednesday and Friday morning for an entire year during, uh, Ebola, right? during the Palm trial in oh, DR Congo, yeah. <clears throat> um, which was you know very exciting. The first trial that found an effective treatment for Ebola virus disease, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, that work was painstaking and drudgerous and difficult and not at all glamorous. <laughs> but yet, I feel like what you guys did such a good job of doing is making in this film is making public health and making public service in general seem glamorous. And was that <laughs> on purpose? Was that something that you hope to use to inspire a next generation? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I think that public service, like being a public servant is at the heart of this film. And I think that when, you know, the relationship between a viewer and a film is you know, a relationship of desire, and therefore, you know, in presenting a public servant and their career, you're establishing, you know, that relationship of kind of, um, you know, admiration and, again, desire. And um, so I think that, um, and, and I think Tony's, again, his charisma that we've all spoken about, you know, certainly reinforces that dialectic between the viewer and the subject. So um, I think certainly, you know, Janet, as a director, admired him and his work, and you you feel that in the film, but you also didn't pull your punches, and um, his shortcomings, you know, especially during the AIDS crisis, et cetera, et cetera, are, are well pointed out, but I think that just makes you trust the filmmakers, that they're showing you something truthful, and therefore perhaps believe in him, in him more. So um, whether or not it was sexy or glamorous, I don't know, but I think there is that, you know, that relationship of, um, admiration, even though the flaws are laid bare. Yeah, he suggested that he wanted to be Brad Pitt, and it happened on Saturday Night Live. So when does that happen to a public servant? Yeah, right? yeah. basically. Yeah. Very, very fair. Uh, so please, let's have your questions for this panel. Hi, I have one. Um, thank you very much. That was a really beautiful film. I didn't think it would be possible for me to like Dr. Fauci more than I did when I walked in here, but <laughs> you actually made that happen. Um, I guess what hurts me is to think that are there more Dr. Fauci's out there? Can we count on people with his integrity and honesty? And that brings me to my, my question, which is, um, the vilification, uh, let me go back. When the pandemic first started, what you heard more than anything was, oh, our public health systems have been decimated. There's no funding for this. After this pandemic, certainly they'll all be beefed up. There'll be public health. Our public health system will be streamlined and well-funded. And now I hear all the time uh, the vilification of Dr. Fauci, the vilification of public health officials around the country. The New York Times did a podcast the other day that I listened to about this public health official in the Midwest and how states and cities are passing um, uh, laws that are going to restrict the ability of public health officials to act in certain ways because they don't want them to have the authority to help us get through future pandemics. And I, like, wh how can we be that stupid? <laughs> I mean, I don't understand it. We're coming out of this pandemic in a worse place than we were public health wise. If what 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 I read and listen to is true, then we went into it. And like, how does that make sense in a country that should be leaders in sensible reactions to things? I I don't know. Does anybody have an answer? <laughs> Thought my questions were hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, from my perspective, first off, it uh, you know what's happened with public health uh, and COVID and um, the attack on experts. Uh, this was just you know Act Ten in a very depressing play that started happening. And you could see early signs of it during Reagan's administration, but it, it's only gotten on hyperdrive in the last 10 years. And, um, you know, we, probably the most destructive moment in history was uh, uh, when by a vote of, you know, 
one justice, we ended up with a president uh, in 2000 who um, basically stomped on the brakes because his base didn't believe in global warming. And so we paused for eight years on uh, doing anything about global warming just at the, the uh, really the only period of time where we had a real chance to, to change things. So I'm talking 20 years ago um, with uh, Bush Jr. And then we paused on the brakes again. You know, COVID was terrible, but as soon as Trump came into office, we threw out all the work that Obama had done for eight years on global warming. So we went to anti-science again. We have, a, we have a situation where we have half the country and one of our major parties uh, is anti-expert and anti-facts. Anti um, and it's not just here, it's happening in, in countries around the world now. Um, it's part of an author authoritarian playbook that we're seeing right and left, and it's anti-democratic as well. So the country is on the precipice, and what is happening to Tony is a symptom of that, and he is feeling it very personally every day. He is, he is the center of dozens of conspiracy theories that hundreds of Americans are spending, are staying up all night on the computer talking about and building from nothing and and then sending him a steady stream of death threats and to his daughters and i mean we're living in really unprecedented times and um, it's all very scary um i don't know you know there's there's a there's a slimmest of chance that we'll turn things around politically over time maybe um but uh it's it's very disconcerting, but it's not just COVID. <laughs> this, is, this is Act 10 uh, of what's been happening uh, uh, with, a, with an anti-factual, um, anti anti-expert stream of, of political leadership uh, for, over, you know, for over 30 years. And if I may, not to broaden the, the topic too much, but, you know, the erosion of voting rights, actually, mm -hmm. and the gerrymandering of districts is, is enabling this because yeah, yeah. Um, you have a political culture which is totally skewed to the extreme because people don't actually need to um, appeal to folks in the middle if they can just draw their own districts, which allows us, you know, which is allowing this kind of um, skewed political discourse, which is essentially totally anti-science and actually like kind of against the mainstream of a middle American ideology. Mm. Um, and so those two issues, you know, climate change, public health, democracy, they're all in a crisis mode all together and they're all mm. part of the same. And I would add for people who really want to think about the importance of experts is I have a friend named Michael Lewis who's, who's a great writer and he, he wrote a book called The Fifth Estate, which is basically about the importance of experts across the government and and why having them move from administration to administration really matters. Um, and um, it's really worth reading and thinking about. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, please. So Peter, how do you find this, the um, emerging activist in terms of, if you would advise, say, the conservationists or the, or the uh, people fighting global warming, how, how would you suggest that they organize themselves to be more impactful? That's a, a great question. Um, and I think it's, and it might be ACT UP's greatest lesson. Um, if there's, you know, one thing that, uh, it led to our split as well. You know, we split apart in year five, which you can see in How to Survive a Plague. It was very painful, but, um, one thing that really defined us during our first five years is because we were a movement uh, of people, many of whom were like myself, had a you know a, a clock ticking over our head. We didn't think we had long to live, and we were losing our friends right and left. If you weren't HIV positive, there was this huge uh, immediacy to uh, you know we felt really like our backs against the wall. And that focused our efforts in a way 
um, that uh, forced us to, like, we have to focus on what is going to work now. And it made us, it actually focused the logic of what had to be, it focused us politically, you know, we didn't, it's like, we had plenty of socialists in ACT UP uh, who wanted to slowly get the movement over time to overturn the, you know, push the pharma industry out of the, out of the way. And we were like, no, <laughs> we don't have time to uh, overturn capitalism. Um, <laughs> so we were very focused and you have some movements in climate change that uh, want to look at, you know, seeing whether they can convince the world to do a low growth path uh, as a way to lower the carbon footprint, to actually become anti-growth or, or close to zero growth worldwide and, and you know, stop population growth and, and uh, stop consumption, et cetera. Um, not looking at the, you know, and obviously there are counter counter economic art, uh, arguments that that would lead to extraordinary levels of poverty and, and famine if you went that that route um, but uh, uh, you know and then you have some in the in the movement who are like well if you really want to do stuff in the next 10 years start building lots of nuclear plants <laughs> you know so it's that type of thing. And I would fall into the nuclear plant category. Uh, so that might make me a, you know, a real outlier in some of the climate change movement. Um, but I think, we're, I, think as a, I think the world has its backs up against a wall. I think the planet definitely does. We have lost way too much time. And pretty much anything we do now is too late. So uh, as quickly as we can abandon carbon, the better. And if that means you know, doing what France is doing really well, which is beginning to add more nuclear plants, not shut them down, um, then that's what we should be doing. Um, and we should look at all available options to as quickly as possible turn off the spigot. Yes. Yeah. Just yeah. Sort of the streaming people are online. Uh, I think Stephanie was talking about this, and I think Peter. It sounds like you have personal experience, but um, how do you recommend navigating representing communities that don't want to speak up for themselves and that you are not a part of? Um, yeah, it just it sounds like a hard thing to do. It is, uh, and I think AIDS has gotten a lot better at it over time. Uh, you know, ACT UP had real diversity issues. We were like 80% uh, gay white men, 15% uh, gay white women, and, and uh, at our peak, maybe 7% people of color, which was kind of unconscionable given that uh, at our peak in 1990, over half of new infections in New York City were in, in black people. So we had real diversity problems. That does not, exist anymore in AIDS activism. We are international. Uh, we are heavily represented across all uh, the affected communities. Um, uh, it is no longer a movement that's driven by gay white men. Um, uh, I'm an old dinosaur, and I should be. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, and that took time. Um, and that took. Uh, uh, a maturation of the movement. Um, but uh, I've seen it happen, so I know it's doable. Um, and I think it's, you know, one of the, to be blunt, one of the reasons it's happened is because the movement got professionalized over time with uh, organizations having an AIDS portfolio or being totally dedicated to AIDS, um, getting long-term funding, and uh, eventually diversifying their staff. So, I mean, AIDS is largely professionalized now. It's no longer an all-volunteer movement based on a community. It's people working at AIDS service organizations around the world. And those employees, the, those organizations, eventually got very good at diversity. 
all of them. And now we have a very diverse AIDS, AIDS activist community internationally. I would add two things, and I normally don't. I try and be on point, but um, just because, one, we have a, someone who was in Monrovia, because I was there, too. And um, But first, I'd say that Dr. Barney Graham, who was the head of the COVID research at NIH, um, just left, and he said to me, I need to get out of the way, because I'm taking all the money from all the young researchers. And Kizzy Corbett, who worked for him, who's a young African-American researcher, just left and is now at Harvard. And I thought, wow, that is one of the smartest things I've said. And I think about that now, is that it's all of a certain generation's job to pave the way for a much more diverse group and to get out of the way so that group can have money and power and voice, whether it's in films or in academia. Um, what I will uh, sort of digress and, and tell the story is we also don't often see it. When I was in Liberia, the the whole time of making a pandemic film about flu and Zika and Ebola, the angriest I was, way angrier than, than any time on the, on the subject on this film, was at the end of um, December, I was in a trailer with a Dr. Soka Moses, who you may know, and um, who was the youngest doctor running an Ebola treatment unit in Liberia. And he was two years out of medical school when he stepped up to run a unit because the doctors were either dead or no one else would volunteer. And so two years out of medical school, he started running this unit. And by December, things were better. And he had 300 people under him, WHO um, psychologists, Cuban doctors and nurses, and nutritionists, all these librarians. And USAID is all over the tent. So we're, he's exhausted. And I say, Soka, now that it's a little bit better, what do you want? And he said, if I could only have a day off to see my kid. And I was like, of course. that's." But then I said, beyond that, what do you want? And he said, oh, Janet, if I could only have a master's degree in public health. And I was like, are you kidding me? There is a billion dollars coming into the country. And no one has asked him. And he is a superstar. You recognize them at Brown, in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, in Paris, right? And no one had asked him. And then the rest of the story should have been, I thought, great, you know, where do you want to go? I'm in America and I believe anything is possible. He said, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I said, check, I know Peter Piat. But then, unbelievably, so he applied. It was really hard. He was working, he had to go to Ghana to take a TB test, he had no money. So he ended up at the airport without money to pay for a hotel. And you know, I'm like, this is a man who has seen more Ebola patients than most people in the world. Came back, he finally got in, no scholarship money. So mm. I figured out um, two people who could pay for his tuition. That is not sustainable. <laughs> and that's just ridiculous, right? That means that no one saw him and identified him. We don't have a system that makes that possible. The good news is he ended up with a PhD he just emailed me recently, and he's one of the leaders in Ebola and infectious diseases. But that, that means the system is broken because we still don't see the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. in lots of places in the world. And it means we don't really have a good pathway because my asking two people to pay for that is not a good pathway. I, can't, I couldn't do it with nurses, and I felt bad. He was what I could afford to do. So, mm -hmm. uh, Well, I think... Uh, we've reached the end of our time and we'll need to wrap up the panel, but I hope all of you will join us afterwards for the reception. I'm sure the panelists will stick around. Hopefully we'll have a chance to chat a little bit more informally. Uh, but before we do, I want to just give a final round of applause and thank you. Thank you so much for uh, bringing us here. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Always great to be back. <laughs>